Morning, everybody. <laughs> Hunter requested we get started early, and he even said he'll have a short sermon today. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. Uh, glad to see everybody here this morning. I'm sure there's need some more coming in. Um, if you're a visitor here, we welcome you and glad to have you with us. Uh, if you're interested in joining us as a member, just see one of us uh, elders or um, uh, Hunter, and we'll sure put you to work. <laughs> uh, we've been studying Revelations in uh, uh, our Sunday school class. I had the last lesson today, and uh, next week we'll start on Ephesians, so if you're interested in, in coming, uh, uh, we'll start a new session next week. It'd be a good time to start. Um, and since we're into that, I've, well, I'm going to read, and of course, since this period of time, and our, you know, we're having so much conflict and so many things going on, tragedies and hurricanes and wars and stuff, uh, I'm going to read, to open up some more in Revelation 21, verses 1 and following. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth, which is where we are right now, had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. It's, uh, we, we often comment that we, we know how the story ends, and this is what we have to look forward to in spite of what's going on in this world today. Let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for the many blessings that you've always bestowed upon us. Blessings we don't deserve, but out of your love, you've given us. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, for what he taught, how he taught us uh, by both the example and by teaching. We thank you for his love that showed that he went to the cross for us and took our transgressions with him. And we thank you, Lord, for the resurrection, which gives us promise for, for an unending future with you. Now, as we worship you this morning, Lord, help us to, understand, uh, to praise you and give you thanks. It will be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's all stand for our first song. It's listed in the bulletin as TBA. <laughs> oh. No, our first song will be awesome. That's the name of the song, not the... It will be awesome. It will be awesome, but it's, it's the name of the song, too. All right. My God is awesome, He can move mountains, keep me in the valley, hide me from the rain. My God is awesome, heals me when I'm broken, His strength that I've been weakened, forever He will reign. My God is awesome. 
all greet somebody. <laughs> Please greet somebody. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with, with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God, Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our second hymn will be People Get Ready. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Gotta wait. We need some power. <laughs> Y'all are supposed to have the stuff fixed, you know. Sorry. <laughs> fixed. He went his job. <laughs> All right. People get ready. That's what we're doing. Are we ready? All right. Just thank the Lord. You don't need no ticket. 
again. You just thank the Lord. You may be seated. Our next hymn will be, Oh, Praise the Name. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still. Sing your praise. 
Our next hymn will be His Mercy is More. It's me. Tell you what, after these songs, if you can't feel God's presence in this auditorium, uh, there's something wrong. Uh, I almost feel like just saying, let's go. <laughs> I don't know if I can say anything that would be any, any better than what we've heard and what you all have sung. However, <clears throat> the title of this reading is My Sins Are Abolished. The scripture reading is from Matthew 26, verse 28. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the, trans for the forgiveness of sins. The Lord's Supper reminds us that our sins have been forgiven. The word forgiveness denotes complete release, deliverance, and dismissal. 
The root of the Greek word means send away. When God forgives our sins, he does not remember them anymore. Shouldn't we put a sign, keep out sign on our spirits so we can resist sin from, the, from entering our inner selves? Shouldn't we put a no fishing allowed sign over our minds so we stop fishing for remembrances of our past sins or the sins of others? God has forgiven. Amen. With that, we'll have our uh, communion. Amen. We're going to be in 2 Timothy again, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, so I don't know where we'll be next week, and that's because I'm not preaching next week. Um, David Dunn is going to be preaching next week, and I really appreciate that. I will be here, uh, but uh, I'm going to be going to a pastor's conference this coming week. Uh, and so David is uh, going to come and share from the Word for us next week, and uh, I'm really, really thankful for that. And I just see Billy and Debbie over here. Just notice you all are over there. It's good to see you all. I had not seen you either. Um, anyway, I'm um, in prayer for David for next week, and I'm excited to see what the Lord brings to his heart and his mind. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, uh, and the name of this sermon is called Vessels of Honor. <clears throat> Vessels of Honor, 2 Timothy 2, verses 20 through 22. And if you would, if you're able, uh, please stand as we go to the word of the Lord this morning. Starting in verse 20, it begins as such, it says, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, <clears throat> some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, and ready for every good work. So flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And you all may be seated. So I assume that we are all here this morning at church because we have the desire, as we preached about last week, especially in verse 15, where Paul calls upon Timothy to do our best to present ourselves to God um, as one that is approved, a worker that need not be ashamed. I'm assuming that's why we're here, because we have that desire, or at least we have some uh, inkling of an interest to figure out what Christianity is all about, what the Bible teaches. Um, and so that's what we're discussing today. How, to, how do we, continuing to talk about how do we present ourselves as one approved, a worker who need not be ashamed. Now, I don't need to give any pointers to myself or to any of you on how to be a bad worker like we learned about last week because that comes pretty naturally to us. But I'm thankful for the scriptures here today that I believe has a lot of wisdom uh, Paul gives to Timothy about how we can present ourselves before God as this approved worker. In these three verses, hopefully this will help for aiding in memory, there's three P's that we're going to look at as we talk about what it means to present ourselves as good workers. Picture, privilege, <clears throat> pursuit. Verse 20 will be picture, verse 21 will be privilege, and verse 22 will be pursuit. And so we start with the picture. We start with that in verse 20. He talks about this house. It's a great house, and it has a variety of vessels. And of course, we have here Paul referring to this great house, referring to um, the household of households, the church, uh, the grouping of God's people together. He thinks of that great house as containing this variety of vessels, and he describes that the vessels have uh, different uses. And I feel like this is very interesting for us to discuss today. Um, it says that some of these vessels are made of gold and silver. Uh, some are made of more common things like wood and clay. Some are used on occasions of great honor, maybe the golden or definitely the gold and silver vessels. And some are used um, for dishonor. My, maybe like we might think of a, a garbage bin or an ashtray. Now hang with me here as we talk about all this. Accordingly, the nature of the vessels we have here have different purposes. Some are used for great honor. Some are used for great dishonor. But all of it here is going to be according to the discretion of how the master wants to use it. So think of the different items in your home, and maybe this will put into mind some of the differences of how an object might be used for honor or for dishonor. If my wife Amanda makes a, a crock pot full of soup and serves it to me in a bowl, I will eat it, and it will be delicious. Now, if she uh, gets it out of the crock pot and puts it in the dog's water bowl, first of all, I know I did something wrong, and I'll have to stop what I'm doing and figure it out. 
because I probably don't know, but I will figure it out eventually. But if she does that and puts it in this bowl, guess what? I'm not going to eat it. Now, the dog's water bowl certainly has a purpose, but it's not for the purpose of a, a husband eating soup out of unless I'm in tremendous trouble, right? A toothbrush and a toilet brush both serve very important purposes, but they are not interchangeable. Do not mix them up. Now, I note, as I said earlier, uh, it talks about the honorable and the dishonorable, and we remember that it is the master that has the proprietary right over all the vessels and to use them how he might want to do so and how he might want to see fit. But I think it's so interesting. Paul seems to be saying here that our usefulness to the Lord, our usefulness to the Lord's kingdom in advancing the gospel message is often connected to our level of cleanliness. I want to clarify a few things because maybe some of you are thinking I'm saying some things that I am not. First of all, this is not a discussion in terms of our salvation. We can't do anything to add to our salvation. Paul here is discussing how we present ourselves before God as approved workers that need not be ashamed. He is not discussing about how we attain the forgiveness that we require for our sins. So we're not talking a matter of salvation here. He's talking about how we better serve Christ and his kingdom, not how we enter into it. We are saved by God's grace, not our ability cleanse ourselves point blank period so don't think I'm adding in any works based stuff second of all God is it is not Paul is not saying here that God determines uh, just you know according to whatever that some vessels are honorable and others are dishonorable and then there's nothing whatsoever that you can do about whichever one you've been sorted into we must be saved by Jesus Christ to go from a child of wrath to a child of God. And that applies to all people, right? That's universally across the board. So we all have that equal playing field, right? That we all have to go from children of wrath to children of God, not according to our works, but according to what Jesus Christ has done. We go from sinners to saved sinners, right? That's the transition. We go from sinners to to save sinners. But I want to just clarify those things so that there's no confusion. And I want to continue on specifically looking at verse 21 when Paul says, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable. I just think that's so interesting. If anyone cleanses himself, first of all, I find this encouraging and it, uh, it corroborates the second point I made above, but the fact that it says if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, that means there's the implication that the dishonorable vessel can be cleansed and is now once again honorable. Praise the Lord for that. When the, dishonorable, the dishonorable vessel does not have to stay forever dishonorable. And that's a reason and an occasion for praise. But I want to think carefully about what Paul is saying here. Because the main aspect by which we are cleansed, it comes to us as we trust in Jesus and we trust in his work that's done on our behalf. Right? So that work of cleansing really is God's work in us and it's God's work for us. It's not our work whatsoever. That's the first sense by which we are cleansed. And that's the sense we get from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If you want to make a note or write that down to look at, but I'll read it. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right? So when we think of being cleansed, that's the first way in which we could do it, should think about it. God does the work in us and for us. It's not our work that is doing cleansing. But Paul is clearly saying here that there is some aspect of our cleansing in which God looks for us to participate to join in our will and our effort, not in means of our salvation, right? But in means of our sanctification. It is not a work that is apart from God. It is not something that we do outside of God or his power, but it is a work that awaits our will and our effort. It's a work that is in collaboration with God and it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. He says, if anyone cleanses himself, and I believe what he's talking about here, this aspect of cleansing ourselves and being useful, it is meaning a connection with being useful for service to the Lord and a closer relationship, um, a closer felt relationship with him. 
So when he speaks here about us being uh, cleansed from these dishonorable uses and purposes, this is not just a cleansing in which God does for us and we sit passively by. This has an aspect in which we participate. It's a sort of self-cleansing that goes beyond the general cleansing from sin. It's a cleansing we participate in and we continually identify sins in our, the sin in our lives with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We see the sin that we are still engaged engaging in and we take it before the Lord over and over and over and over again. That is part of that process by which we cleanse ourselves. Uh, it, it gives this, this idea, these three conditions here. If you are to be a vessel that is set aside and regarded for honorable use, there's three conditions as we see in the text. One, they're set apart as holy. Two, they are useful to the master. And three, they are ready for every good work. Going back to this idea of the things we have in our home, we all probably have, you know, bowls or plates or cups or whatever that we use more than others. Some you might set aside just on your table, uh, you know, for some honorable purpose. You know, may maybe you don't. Maybe you only use paper and plastic. But I'm sure we all have things in our home that are set aside for these special purposes. And that's what it means to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be made holy, and so when we are set apart by the Lord, we are not only more able to be useful to what the master wants for us, but it makes us ready for every good work. That brings us to the next P. Right? The first was the picture, and the second is privilege. It is a privilege that we are able to be used by God for whatever purpose he has, but especially that we can cleanse ourselves, that we can submit to the work of the Holy Spirit, and that we can offer ourselves as an honorable worker, as an approved worker for God's purposes. And because it is a privilege to present ourselves that way, it is also a privilege that we are able to cleanse ourselves in that way. It is a privilege to be able to be under the Holy Spirit's ministry in which we identify the sin in our life and he helps us take it before the Lord. Now, I want to be clear once again, I am not saying that some uh, Christians or some people are better or more worthy or more valuable than others. We must not ever come to a point where um, we think some Christians are better, they have some super Christianity within their heart that the others of us just don't have the opportunity to possess. This is not a matter of value or worth or inherent betterness. But I think we can all agree in what Paul is saying here that some Christians, according to their participation in this ministry, they put themselves in positions where they are able to be better used by God than others because they are willing to continuously cleanse themselves from sin by submitting to the Holy Spirit. And they have thus made themselves more usable to God. It says that they are prepared for any and every good work. That doesn't just mean serving the church on a Sunday. That means no matter where you are, if you're at home, if you're at work, if you're at the grocery store, right, you are set apart for the Lord. You want to be useful to the master to use as he pleases, and thus you are ready for every good work. So according to the text here, I found this so fascinating, there's a large sense in which God um, wants us to desire that we can be used by him to a greater degree, right? We have the desire to want to submit ourselves more and more to how the master would wish to use us. So our conduct, whether it's clean or unclean, whether it is set apart to God or whether it's not set apart to God, whether it's useful to Jesus or whether it's not useful to Jesus, it all really, really matters. And I think we should think about that as we go through our lives, that yes, we have this standing in grace, but that doesn't give us the license to just do as we please if we truly want to be useful to the Lord and his ministry. The things that we do really matter. And so if I'm continuously doing things and putting myself into situations where I am sinning or causing others to sin because I'm just, you know, whatever, abusing grace, I am harming the way in which the Lord may choose to use me. Now, that's generally speaking, of course, because God could take the most wretched person on earth and do whatever he wants with him. But generally speaking, even as Christians, our conduct matters for how useful and effective we are at serving the Lord. And this brings us to our third P, which is pursuit. We're going to talk about how we run from, we run after, and we run with. 
pursuit. Paul gives us some instruction in verse 22 on how we do this work. How do we cleanse ourselves, right? How do we rid ourselves of these sins and these things that we're talking about? How do we submit ourselves more to the ministry of the Holy Spirit? I don't want to be used for dishonorable purposes. Lord, I want to use, I want to be used for honorable purposes. How do we do that? And he says to pursue. First of all, he says this, he says, flee from youthful lusts. Youthful lust or youthful passions, youthful desires, your, your translation might say something slightly different. I believe what this means is those sort of desires and temptations that are especially prominent when someone is an adolescent or a young adult. And specifically, I think Paul is talking here about being immature. There are people that just never mature spiritually because they're not reading, they're not praying, they're not working, they're not serving, they're not meeting with other Christians, they're not coming to church. And so it's like their spiritual growth is stagnated. They are refusing to grow up into this faith and to spiritually mature. And so they just continue to go after their youth, youthful lusts and passions. Maybe that's things like sexual temptation material gratification, uh, prone to anger, a longing for fame and glory and popularity, you know, whatever it is, that's not an exhaustive list. Paul tells us regardless, whatever these youthful lusts are, flee from them. That's the command he gives, and it's simple. Run away. Don't entertain these youthful lusts. Do not even consider them. Don't think about them. Don't challenge them. Don't say, I'm going to prove how strong I am, and I'm going to lock in, and I'm going to try and endure them. Don't do that. He says, run. You know, get out of Dodge is what he says. And maybe you're thinking, well, to run away doesn't really sound like, you know, what I've been taught that like I'm a warrior and the Lord's going to use me and all this stuff. But when we come against sin, it is not an occasion for us to be lax. It is not an occasion for us to waffle or to think that maybe we're strong enough. When we encounter sin and we are in the presence of a temptation to sin, we should not consider that as a time to discuss it. That is a time to flee from that sin. We sprint away from these occasions that would cause us to stumble and be tempted. I've heard people say, before that they want to put themselves into areas in which they are tempted just to prove their spiritual growth. And that is so, so dangerous because you might, yeah, sure, you might be strong in that moment and you might be able to, but all it takes is one little stumble of the flesh and then you fall into those temptations and you maybe just develop these nasty habits again and again. So when it comes to sin and the temptation to sin, it is so unwise to entertain it whatsoever. It's not about proving our strength or proving God's strength or anything. If you are tempted to sin, flee from it. Have you ever heard someone say that they're really praying about what to do about something, but then they tell you what it is, and it's clear the Bible would say against that thing? I've heard people say that to me before. Obviously, I won't give examples, but I've heard people say, I'm really praying about whether I should do this. And that thing is clearly outlined in Scripture as something you should not do. Well, the more uh, a useful thing for them to do would not be to pray about whether they should do something that violates Scripture. The more useful thing they should do is to flee from it, right? When Joseph was approached by Potiphar's wife, did he say, hold on a minute, I got to pray about this. I got to pray about whether I'm going to enter into this physical union with this married woman. He absolutely didn't. He got out of Dodge. He left so quickly that she was holding on to his outer garments and he ran away without his outer garments on. Right? He looked like he was coming out of a state of sin because he got away from it so quickly. And when we are in these times uh, in, in which, w whether we're actively sinning or whether we have a temptation to sin, we flee from it. Remember Joseph, remember Potiphar's wife. Anytime you think you might even be entertaining a temptation for you to stumble into sin, don't feel like it's some weakness or you're a coward for getting away. That's the biblical command to flee from youthful lusts. This idea that we might test ourselves to see if we're strong or that we can stand against it, it has made many people fall into sin. It is not worth that test whatsoever. It is far better to fall, as the scripture says, and flee from the presence of sin. 
I believe Paul's saying here, if you cannot flee from your youthful lusts, your youthful passions, there is going to be a real limit that you are imposing on yourself on how the master will use you for his purposes. Right? If you cannot say no to the things you are continuously struggling with, then how can you really say yes to the master and being used however he would want you to? Because we have to remember that sin contaminates everything. Right? If I have a bowl of soup, I don't know why I'm talking so much about soup, but if I have a bowl of soup and it's got mud on the spoon that I have, if I put that muddy spoon into the soup, what happens? Does it contaminate the spoon further with the soup? No, the whole soup and the bowl and everything within it becomes contaminated by the mud. The spoon surely doesn't get infected with soup, but the soup sure does get muddied up by what was on the spoon. Paul is pleading with Timothy here. He says, watch out for the contaminating effects of sin. And I would plead the same for all of us here today. This applies to every aspect of our lives, not just blatant sin. I'm not just talking about, you know, should I do this thing that's clearly outlined in Scripture? Uh, that if, you, if it says you shouldn't do it, don't do it. Case closed. But what about when you're having to make a judgment call about something you're doing or something you're watching or something you're hearing? You, you know, we have, to, um, we have to consider everything that we do in light of the Scripture. Right, we have to be careful that sin doesn't corrupt our mind and develop bad thinking patterns and habits that goes on to something else. So you have to continuously ask yourselves what we can handle. Can I read this book without falling into sin? This might seem like overkill, but I don't think it is. I think that's what the Bible would teach. Can I watch this TV show without sinning? Can I listen to this music without being prone to sin? Should I hang out with these people in this situation? Right? What can I handle? Because if we want to be useful to God, we have to flee that which might contaminate us. So if something or someone makes us more prone to contaminating ourselves with sin, then we have to flee it. I'm not advocating we go live in a cave and live by ourselves somewhere, but I am saying we have to protect and guard our heart against the contaminating effect of sin. It all sounds really negative to me that we're just fleeing, right? We're not just on the run and all this. But the beautiful thing is, as we are in pursuit of being an approved worker, we don't just flee from these temptations. We are running towards something, right? We run away from sin and all that contaminates, and we run toward God. We flee from that which would contaminate us, and we run to the one who can cleanse us from all contamination, It doesn't just tell us what to flee from, but who to pursue. We run to God, we run to righteousness, we run to faith and peace and love and all these things. Do the things that you know to be right. So once again, if you're in a situation and you're trying to balance out, can I handle this, can I do this? If you know something to be right, I say this simply, do it. If you know something to be wrong, don't do it. (laughs) I hate to just boil it down so simply, but I think there are times when we make things too complex for ourselves. We ask ourselves continuously, what is the right thing to do here? And then we do it. We don't say, God, what would be the quickest thing for me to get out of this situation? What is easiest? What is most convenient? What is going to bring glory and honor to me? What is going to make me the most money? We pursue the right things as we flee from the wrong things. Faith, love, peace, service, righteousness. Cleansing is never just a matter of avoiding all the junk in our lives. It must also be the pursuit of good things. So there are things that we must flee and things that we must pursue. And there's even more good news. As we're doing all this, as we're fleeing from sin, as we are pursuing the Lord, this is not done in isolation. We are not alone as we are running from sin and towards the Lord. The devil wants us to think that we are alone, that we are isolated, that no one understands. If anyone found out, they would hate us, they'd shun us. He wants us to think all these things that will isolate us. He wants us to think we're weak and powerless and that one day we're going to run this race and we are just going to stumble and he is going to devour us. The beautiful thing here, most importantly, we're not alone because we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us that empowers us as we go through this life as Christians. That's most important. And second of all, we have each other. That is one of the biggest reasons why it is so important that the Bible commands Christians to be in fellowship together. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. 
You cannot live the Christian life in isolation. We are commanded to continue meeting with one another until the day of the Lord so that we can encourage and build one another up. And so I challenge you, every time you come together, be it on a Sunday or a Wednesday or a Tuesday or a Thursday or whenever it is that you gather with other believers, I challenge you, if you don't already have this mindset, to adopt it. Every time we gather together with other Christians for worship, we should thank God that he is merciful enough, not just that he has saved us, but that he has saved us. And so that we are running this race with wonderful brothers and sisters alongside of us. If that's not our perspective, we need to adopt that perspective that church is not just some chore that we come to, but it is a place we come alongside brothers and sisters who are all fleeing from sin and running to the Lord so that we can worship him together. God is putting together a great house and he has brought us into right relationship with himself and he does that for his people and we need each other. I'll say this briefly and get to the next point. Um, The company that we keep matters. I don't mean that we just, um, you know, seclude ourselves and never be around, you know, someone outside the church or the sinners or whatever. I'm not saying that whatsoever, but I'm telling us that we need people in our lives that we regularly and routinely meet with or talk to that build us up. We need to routinely surround ourselves with people that are also wanting to present themselves before the Lord as an approved worker, and when we gather with God's, house, with God's children in God's house, then we are in good company of saved sinners that want that same thing that we do. I, I want to end today's sermon. Here it is. I don't know. We'll see. I said it. We joked about it earlier, how, how quickly the end would come. I want to end today's sermon um, in hopes of encouraging us. Encouraging us, uh, not just that we're, you know, we're in this together, but as we've been talking about today, I want to encourage us to greater service for the Lord. Because when a surgeon looks for an instrument, he does not look for a dirty one. When he looks for a syringe to administer medicine, he doesn't go to the little red box on the wall and pull out one of the ones that has been used. He looks for an instrument that has been cleansed and is ready for use. If we are in Christ, God has set us apart. He has set us apart for himself. He has set us apart away from the things that we used to be and that we used to engage in. We are now in Christ in order that he may use us according to his desires. We are set apart so that we can be useful to our master. And if we are ready for any and every good work, we are going to be far more effective at being useful to our master. And that should be our desire not to do the bare minimum, not what's just going to keep us out of hell, but how can we be the most useful vessel for our master to use according to how he sees fit? Do you feel, some questions, do you feel useful to God or do you feel useless to God? I don't want the devil to tell you that you are useless to God, but I also want to tell you if you feel like you're not really doing a lot of things to advance uh, the work of the gospel and the kingdom, th- then maybe there's some things you need to cleanse from yourself. Maybe there are some things that you need to get rid of and subject to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and take those things before the Lord and ask him to remove them from you. And maybe, just maybe, then you will feel even more empowered to do the things that he wants for you to do. Because God has set us apart to do the purposes of his kingdom. And we have to be ready for every good work. And I don't mean that we go in with our own expectations. We go in as a utility player saying, as long as you'll let me on the team, you can give me whatever jersey, you can give me whatever number, you can put me whatever position you want to. Lord, I just want to be on your team and I want you to use me as you see fit. God has set his love upon us. He has given us the privilege of being useful to him, right? It's not something we look at as an obligation. It is a privilege that we can be useful to the one who has saved our soul from the fires of hell. And that privilege of being useful, as Paul says, shows us today, is tied to the way in which we are pursuing godliness in our life. The way that we are fleeing from sin, the way that we are pursuing righteousness, and the way in which we are all doing so in fellowship with one another. And I have one final image for you to consider today. I've started changing my own oil. I've made a mess of myself several times. I'm getting better. But there are a number of steps, but the most crucial one is before you put the new oil in, you have to take the old oil out. 
you're welcome for that mechanic advice. I've got plenty of it. Most of it's not good. You have to drain the old junky, gunky, gross oil from out of the engine before you put the new stuff in. You don't just pour the new on top of the old and just say, well, hopefully that works out, right? You drain the junk and then you put in the new good stuff. That way your engine will run in tip top condition as it was designed to do. Because if it's still got the old gunk in there, or if you mix the old with the new, it's just simply going to have a limited effect and it's not going to run properly. Think of yourselves in this manner if it helps that even as Christians, even as we go forward in this life, we need a daily oil change with the help of the Holy Spirit. A daily engine cleanse in which we say, Lord, show me the junk in my life. Take the junk from me. Help me to let go of the junk and fill me anew with that which you will pour into me. Every single day, consider how we are participating in that, whether we are making ourselves available, whether we are even seeking out being useful to the Lord as he drains us of all the junk and pours his mercies anew into us. And if we do that, if we are committed to doing that, then he will cleanse us. Our minds will be cleansed from false teachings. Our hearts will be cleansed from false attractions. And our wills will be cleansed from false agendas. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I pray that we're all here because we have a desire to be useful to you. God, I pray that if we ever consider our Christianly duty as an obligation, God, please, please help hammer point two into our mind. It is a privilege to be useful to you. God, you, you certainly don't need us for your work. You, you could absolutely do anything that you want without my help. God, you, you don't need me whatsoever, but yet you've chosen to allow me to serve you, to allow me to be a minister of this ministry of reconciliation, and God, that is a privilege. And it's not just for me, it's for each and every one of us. God, help us to see that it is a privilege to serve you and it should be the desire of our hearts that each and every day we present ourselves before you as an approved worker who need not be ashamed. Now, Lord, if that desire is not burning within us, we ask that you give us the mercy that we need to repent from whatever it is that we need to repent of, from whatever's holding us back. And God, we ask with the Holy Spirit's help that you implant that desire within our hearts that each and every day we present ourselves each and every morning anew, each and every night before we go to bed, we present ourselves as an approved worker who need not be ashamed. God, help us to flee from the presence of sin in our lives. Help us to identify that with the help of the Holy Spirit. Help us to let go of those things. Help us to subject ourselves even to your chastisement if it brings us to repentance. God, help us to flee from the lustful, uh, youthful lusts and, and passions and pursuits. God, get rid of all those things to pursue righteousness and to know that as we run this race, we are in this together. And we have the Holy Spirit first and foremost, but God, we also have each other. So help us to encourage one another, help us to spur one another, and help us to consider daily as we go through our lives what it means that we would have that daily engine cleansing in which the old junk is taken out and we are filled afresh and new. Lord, we ask for your help in this process because we can do nothing without the help you provide us. And we thank you that you've given your Holy Spirit to guide us. Lord, we love you. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. I want to ask you all to stand and we have one, one final song. Um, uh, and, and as